reaching artists around the world. Artists around the world. Teaching artists around the world. Artists around the world. Teaching artists around the world. Artists around the world. How are you, my friend? Where are you? Hello. <laughs> Welcome. I'm outside. Um, it's great I to have you that. as our visiting artist. And uh, apologies about the little delay on my end. Um, you're like a magical person. I can't, it's, you know, it's so crazy. The last time we spoke, <laughs> we were talking about starting alternatives at the beginning of the pandemic. And then we've started alternative art school. Um, All right. Yeah. Well, are you, still, are you in Barcelona? I am. Yes. That's well, I'm going nice. to Nice. Well, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let turn it over to you to do the talk and introduce yourself. I'll just say this. Um, Spain is famously the land of anarchists. And in my mind, Leo is the heart of that kind of history in his joy and ebullience and his, and the, and the work that he's done both as an activist and an artist has actually reverberated in things like Occupy Wall Street and social movements across the globe. And I do think he's seen firsthand the way these things actually translate into an international language of solidarity. And I really appreciate your joy in doing it all the while. So I'll hand it over to you, but you're a magical person. But all that is only and only in your mind, okay? <laughs> it's only in your mind. <laughs> hey, nice to be here, Nato. Thank you so much for the invitation. Very glad to, to share with you all, guys. <clears throat> I mean, I was talking with Nato about this presentation and he wanted that I present my work, I mean, a part of my work. So I put all this presentation together this morning, which is uh, you know, a bunch of projects I've been involved with since many years ago. I mean, makes me feel my age. Presentation. And so our journey starts uh, in 1999. I don't know how old is the people in the room actually, but I guess this sounds like far away for everyone. Um, that year, you know, it was uh, in November of 1999, um, just a month, you know, before the end of the 20th century. Um, the thing in Seattle happened. <clears throat> and that was an event that caught everyone by surprise, actually, you know, uh, the so-called end of history, you know, um, in, right in that time, you know, a crowd of young people attired with drums and gas masks managed to, you know, to turn upside down the, the annual summit of the World Trade Organization. And that, um, uh, those boys, you know, and girls, and intervening their arms at the gates of the center where the World Trade Organization meeting was supposed to take place. And those Robocop policemen, you know, spraying their faces with pepper spray, somehow brought back, you know, political and social activism into the field again. Um, and suddenly everyone wanted to be part of that new thing. Uh, that had just emerged, including, of course, museums of contemporary art. Um, so just a few months after that, those events in Seattle, um, the MAGBA, you know, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Barcelona, management, I mean, the MAGBA management contact uh, us, you know, a group of friends in that, time to coordinate a meeting regarding art and new social movements, you know, like those in Seattle, they say. Um, so we named ourselves Las Agencias, the agencies, and began to prepare a big workshop called Direct Action as one of, of the fine arts. Um, the workshop ended, ended up being, you know, the most, the most success one in the, in the museum history, which is not much, you know, but it was 
something in that time. I mean, during the workshop, we had learned that the World Bank, you know, and the International Monetary Fund uh, had decided to hold their, their next meeting in Barcelona at the beginning of, of June of that year of that year so so we we propose ourselves to receive them as they deserve you know so so we propose to the museum to continue with the agency's project um, until then and the museum say yes and not only say yes they give us 70,000 euros which is plenty a lot you know the museum accept and give us around that money and so, so that we could carry out our plan. We had never seen such a large amount of money before, nor have we seen since then, you know. Um, so yeah, so the first decision we made as Las Agencias, you know, was that no one would collect a single cent of the of those uh, seventy two thousand euros um, that Mag that Magba has given us, um, it was a risky decision actually because at that at that time none of us had secure financial incomes, you know, at all. So still, but still, um, I'm convinced that that it was a wise decision, you know, wise decision. Um, it was smart to do that, you know, putting aside the personal economy and allocating all the money to the projects. Uh, we were starting to develop, you know, um, led to a way of working that was free of external constraints somehow, you know. So what we first did with the money from the museum was buying a bus, you know. I guess we thought, when are we going to be able to buy a bus? If not now, right? So that's the first, th the first thing we did. Mm. We found this very ugly and, and old bus in the north of Spain. And we went there one day and we buy it, you know, with the money from the museum. And we named it the show bus. And we started to transform it that, you know, the idea was to transform that old bus into a space intervention device. So here we are, you know, in the process of transforming this, this bike all. Um, what we were pushing with the, with the so bus was to develop a series of interventions, you know, tactics that, um, that precisely becomes, um, precisely because they were in constant movement, you know, were not easily located and, and therefore surprised. So mobile tactics capable of eluding, you know, the mandates of order imposed on the space and allowing us to make unpredictable use of it. The idea was to, to be able to use the space, you know, the, the public space that we were feeling that we were losing it more and more in that time. So, Today, is, it is widely assumed that art, you know, um, has to be involved in its social context, right? If it wants to be truly contemporary, and that the artist is not uh, so much an individual producer of ob objects anymore, but a collaborator, and a, you know, producer of situations and so on. But in that time, you know, that wasn't so trendy, believe me. So here we are, you know, we, you know, opening those social processes in order to transform this, this bus. And we did it. We, we actually transformed this old machine into a, a space interventionist uh, vehicle machine, you know, with a stage on the roof and all the screens became, you know, all the windows became screens. So we could use them in different ways. We also installed these workstations in side so we were able to work from there we also installed a, a wi-fi sign out which was very difficult in that time so yeah when we were when we had everything ready we started to make many actions with it you know <clears throat> here we are just going out of the museum that was our parking you know for the bus and every time um 
we use it, we came out from there and we occupy different spaces. Many, many social movements and grassroots organizations were using this tool for, for the time that it was, you know, useful. Mm -hmm. You have some pictures of it, you know, how the, the bus worked in that time. This is a very famous band in Spain, actually playing on the roof of the bus in the center of Barcelona. Here you have, you know, parties and, you know, DJs and VJs uh, working in the bus. We occupy the space in many different ways, you know, to do many different things like, you know, parties or meetings or, or gatherings, you know, or cinema on the streets or uh, concerts. Uh, so that was like a very useful tool that we developed out of this money from the museum. Um, the second thing we did with that money was dress well. Because again, you know, when are we going to be able to dress well if not now, right? With such a bunch of money we had. So, you know, we call it, uh, this project we call it Preta Revoltem because we were trying to do with the revolt something similar to what the Preta a Porte did in fashion, you know. In a way, Preta a Porte meant the mass consumption of fashion, that's what it means, you know. It's democratization, we could say, right? Um, and our collection of suits, you know, kind of do the same thing, you know, something similar with the revolt and social activism, democratize it until it became a phenomenon of masses, you know. So here we are, these, these are the costumes we designed. The idea was to make these unisex suits that would serve uh, in two different purposes. You know. On one hand, the suits have to protect the users in, in a demonstration or, or any other type of situation, you know, in which their bodies were in injured in your risk. On the other hand, our suits uh, had to respond to the precepts of what we call in that time direct representation. That is the own an autonomous capacity that we had to represent to represent, you know, what we could say our way of life. You know. So we did we did not like at all how social activism was portrayed in the media. Journalists at the time had just had begun introducing you know the, the term black bloc to describe the anti-globalization movement. And that, that was something that we didn't like at all. You know, this term reduced a rich, complex, you know, and diverse social experience to a group of brainless young men hooded, you know, and dressed in black, uh, dedicated to the arduous task of you know, stunning and destroying the cities through which they pass. So we didn't like that term at all. And we wanted to change that imaginary, you know. So, so we set out to concretize, to concretize, you know, to do in, in a fashion design, all the richness and diversity of the anti globalization movement. That was our trial. That's what we wanted to do with, this, with these costumes. You know? And here you have some pictures of how we did, how we did so, you know. As you can tell, uh, the costumes had protections on the neck and waist, pimples, you know, because we were doing workshops also with ex-officers, police, you know, people that they were police when they were young and they, they went out and they were refusing their pass, so they wanted to help, you know, and they were telling us how the police act in those kind of, you know, those kind of actions, and we were, you know, we always use the same process. I mean, our working process is always the same. It's we open a social space where a lot of different people meet. And all together, we create all these projects, you know, the ideas and the research for the projects and all that. So we also install some, some airbags in the costumes, uh, airbags like these ones, which are, very funny, you know, because when the police attack someone, you always could use it and protect yourself. 
uh, and creating very funny images because that was the second, actually, the second hand. I mean, that was the other part of the project that we were looking for, protect people, but also create images, the images we wanted to see, you know, on media about activism and so on. We have different collections inside of Pretap of Ten. And this is uh, regular ones, you know, the summer, the summer costumes. And also these ones which were called garbage sports, you know. These ones were made out of empty bottles of water, you know, with a tap on, of course. Um, so we so we were using the air pressure as protection and also this plastic bag, this garbage plastic bags. Uh, we had this this kind of uh, uh, costumes for to be in the first line, you know, front of the where, where the real conflicts are happening, you know. So preta porte, this is how they looks like in the daily life, you know. All these. All these costumes and many people actually sees the mayor of the city right now. I told you this is long ago. Things change. Um, so there you are. You know the different collections of Preta Porte acting on the streets and so on. Preta Porte, I mean, was a kind of brand. So we were doing all the brand thing, you know, like commercials and and. You know, designs for the brand and events and so on. Here you have, a, for instance, a clip that we did for for TV. You know. <laughs> So you see, that's another project we were doing in that time with that money that the museum gave us. You know, that was the same, the same, the same period. You know, we were all doing all these workshops, preparing that meeting of the World Bank um, in Spain, in Barcelona. So as you can see, this idea of creating the images you want to see on TV was a kind of important thing in that time for us, and all the projects we were developing in had that thing in mind always, you know, art money is another one of that period. Art money, money is the sort um, way of saying manifestación, you know, demonstration in Spanish. So that was like art for demonstrations somehow, and also was, you know, playing with our money, of course. Um, so the, the vulnerability of the bodies in mass protest uh, situation was something that worried us in Las Agencias kind of a lot in, in that period. Um, and our money were portable seals, you know, made out of uh, a very light and resistant material, capable of performing at least a couple of functions of great importance to us. You know, one on one hand, the Armani seals, once again, serve to protect, protect, uh, to protect the protesters, you know, from, from any act of violence that could happened during the protests, you know, police charge and rubber bullets, impacts and all that. Um, on the other hand, our money was, uh, as its name suggests, you know, an art exhibition designed to be displayed um, at demonstrations. You know? So we were always doing this creating uh, work, you know, of selecting pictures uh, from from artists all over the world, and we created uh, different exhibitions in any demonstrations. You know? uh, so we were acting with our money in many, many cities, in many different demonstrations with different um, collections. You know, the photographs attached to the out to the outer surface, you know, of the seals made made a visual and symbol, you know, capable to attract to attracting the eyes of, um, of everyone, you know, including, of course, the journalists in, in charge of uh, covering the event. Uh, we were looking for that, you know, we were after that, that idea of uh, create this canvas so the journalists would be so attracted by that they were actually reproduce those images in the media, you know. 
So the, the bodies of the protesters covered by those large format, you know, photographs made an outerly irresistible visual, you know, and symbol for the press cameras. Um, here, I think this one is in New York, yeah. I mean, it was a practical way to sneak into the media, as I say, you know, new and unpredictable interpretation of social, social activism. And we were creating these kind of images and we were able to reproduce the, those in the media, you know, images like that, for instance, you know, it was funny to see, you know, Armani was another way we found to, to face the world using the image as, as a seal, you know, I guess. So Armani appeared uh, innumerable times in the newspapers of that time, you know, the eruption of those images, so different from the use by the media, you know, about that reason, somehow inaugurate a new social protest imaginary, a new way of interpreting and feeling it, you know. So another project we did in that time was this one called La Bolsa o la Vida, which means, you know, your money or your back or your life, the money or your money or your life, you know. And the World Bank uh, meeting was, as I say, was getting closer, you know. And the local media kept repeating the many riots that would occur during the protest, you know. They say it on TV, they say it on the newspaper, everywhere. But they didn't, they still had no minimal evidence to corroborate their, their stories, you know. So not a single photograph with, with uh, which to illustrate such a assumption. Not a single burning contain, container, not even a broken store window, nothing. It was then that we came up with, with this project, you know, La Bolsa La Vida, your money, your, your life. Um, <clears throat> the World Bank, uh, uh, you need to understand, I guess, that bolsa in Spanish has two different meanings, you know, it means a bag, a plastic or a paper bag, but it also means a stock exchange, right? So, so we were looking for um, how we are going, I mean, the meeting was about to happen. We were working for months in this project, but still we were just, you know, a bunch of losers <laughs> trying to stop this big, international bank, you know, and gathering in, in our city. So, so we were like trying to look for an idea of what to do. And one day we discovered that the Barcelona Stock Exchange building was considered a tourist interest, you know, and therefore you, you can schedule a tour. And that was the, tr the trigger for, for our actions, you know. Uh, one morning we called to the Barcelona Stock Exchange offices and ask for a guide tour, you know, of the interior of the, of the building, you know. A very friendly woman answer, you know, um, um, that there would be no problem. You know, we asked for a, for a meeting, for a visit, and she was like very polite and she was like, yeah, of course, no problem. Just tell me how many people, you know, uh, she only needed to know the approximately number of people who would visit. And then we were like, well, 10,000 or less, you know, and he told her around. Um, so, so right after hanging up the phone, the friendly woman did exactly what we wanted her to do, you know, call the police. Some days before we were actually in front of that building taking those, these pictures, you know, um, we, did, we dedicate some time to send, you know, a series of photographs taken, you know, this few days before at the doors of the stock exchange building to the editorial offices, you know, the local newspapers and so on. So there were photos in which we appear, as you can see, you know, portrayed as an ordinary group of tourists, you know, but with bags over our heads, you know, bags on the stock exchange, you know, bag, bag, you know, very conceptual, everything. Um, um, so the photos were accompanied, they, they came with, by, with a note that we sent to them to the newspapers too, saying that, that we are preparing the most massive visit in history to the Bank Stock Exchange building. And of course, uh, that all the press was invited. Uh, 
they love the pictures, you know. I guess those pictures were the ones they were looking for during months, you know. They didn't have uh, proofs of they were of what they were saying. So they start to print them out in the newspapers and also on TV, you know. So the police react to that, to those pictures, sending more and more police to the to the door of the building, you know. Um, the government order to, to expand the control measures, you know, that the police already had installed around the stock exchange building. Um, so more fences, you know, more vans, more dogs, more police officers, you know, a very complete control device and everything to avoid a visit that on another hand, Guess that you already know that we didn't we didn't plan to attend, of course. You know. So since they were, you know, printing out these printing those pictures on newspapers, we we were sending more and more, and we kept sending these pictures to the press, and they were, you know, putting on this putting them on the, the newspapers every day. So finally, you know, the only ones that uh, affected by these control measures were the brokers, of course, who used to, who used as they were to enter in and live in the stock exchange building as they, as if they owned the place, you know. So um, suddenly they were so pissed off of, you know, being their search and controlled by dogs and everything. Um, that in order to protest against that, they decide not to go, you know, they decide to, to, I mean, they became so annoyed by everything that they decide to stop going to the stock exchange building for a couple of days in protest, you know. So believe it or not, the stock exchange building was closed for two consecutive days, you know, just because by a simple home call, you know, and a few absurd photographs. So we ran a huge party to celebrate it. We learned something very important, you know, that me, that says the less you do, the better, you know. And we try to apply that since since then. <laughs> um, so accompanied by by the soba sobas and with loud music playing, you know, hundreds of people spend like an entire day dancing at the frenetic piece with bags over their heads, you know, in front of that building and having swims, you know, taking swims in that fountain, which is in front, right in the middle of the city, you know, in the economical uh, center of the city. Um, and it's so, um, so that was like a, a very success, successful action. And all these projects during those months, they were every day on the press, you know, we had like a lot of attention, you know, all these projects fill the pages of the press daily and, and even months before the World Bank and, and the IMF, you know, in Barcelona. So that created a kind of tension, you know, with all that. And finally, uh, the, World, the World Bank decided, you know, you know, all that together with the massive participation of people in the marches and events, you know, against the summit organization, made the World Bank and the IMF decide to cancel their meeting for the first time in the history, right? It was not the first time that happened. And, and we all experienced it as a triumph, of course. You know? We celebrated in, in style. We decided to continue with the mobilization program, even if, if they cancel, you know, that had already been made public. Um, so all our projects had like great, a great relevance on those massive mobilizations that we did after. Uh, the show pass, the Brett Revolte suits, the Armani photographic seals were all used by so many people in those days, you know. All these May things um, go so tense that the very delegate of government asked to the director of MAGBA, the museum, you know, to, to cancel, you know, with our, uh, to stop our activities immediately. So that's what the museum did. 
but before that they the the director wrote like an amazing long article about explaining how cool the music was to having us you know and how that made the difference with MoMA or with the Guggenheim or whatever and that I mean actually make him to jump from Barcelona contemporary music director to Reina Sofia in Madrid which is a bigger institution and we we came back to our autonomy <laughs> after that but with new tools you know new projects and we took the bus we took uh, our suits, we took our seals, we were better than, than before. So one year later, you know, European Union uh, was scheduled to meet in, in Spain. Um, and a campaign called against the Europe of Capital and Globalization and War um, was launched, you know, was launched across, across the country to protest at each of the summits that they were scheduled, you know, all over the country. So the idea was for it to travel, you know, the country offering itself, um, the South with the Sobus, you know, our Sobus was going to be one of the, the main protagonists of this protest, you know, the idea, as I said, was to, to go, I mean, was to travel with it, you know, offering the, that big tool to many different grassroots movements and so on. But one day before the first demonstration began, you know, in Barcelona, the show booths appear like this, completely destroyed and burned out. Mm. They went inside, inside it and, and at night and destroyed the desk, screens, you know, driver's cabin. And then they went up on the roof and, and did the same with the stage. Finally, they used, you know, gasoline on it and set it on fire. Um, so the news caught us completely perplexed, you know, we were like, what? <laughs> uh, and we didn't know what, what to do or say after that, you know. Uh, none of the usual responses uh, given to this type of incident uh, com convinced us completely, you know. We had two different storytelling we could use, right? The cry baby. So we could go in front of the press crying and saying, I don't know why someone did that with our bus because we are such a good guys, you know. We didn't see ourselves in that storytelling very much. Um, and also the Avenger, you know, that was another option me there in front of the camera saying that somebody burned out our bus and now we are going to burn everything we found on our way or something. But we didn't see ourselves on that, in that thing neither. So actually what we did, you know, so after giving it some thought, um, we were inclined to make an opportunity of the crisis. That was what we did actually, and and take advantage of this uh, incident to publicly present, you know, our new projects. New Kids on the Black Block, such a radical group that burned uh, its own bus, you know. So that's how we present ourselves. We went there. We took very cool pictures, you know, like this. We put we put on our suits, you know took some very funny pictures on the barn bus um, and sent them to the press alone with a note that says, we are the new kids on the black block, such a radical group that we burn out our own bus, you know. So of course, these pictures were like, like a report all over, you know, on TV. And uh, so it works, it was like a charm, you know, in just a few hours, everyone knew the new kids on the black block. So, so since the beginning, that was like a very successful, you know, uh, project. This is this is how the, this new collective identity, like because that is what it was, and you can the Black was a collective identity, an anonymous and collective identity that everybody, anyone could use. So that's how this collective identity managed to sneak into the new generation machinery, which is the press, you know. And shortly, uh, hundreds of unconditional supporters, you know, began to adhere to its cause, you know. The Nukes on the Black Block, 
itself were was a project that we were, you know, stealing the whole language of fanzines and and teenage um, fan clubs, you know, pins and stickers and fanzines and t-shirts and and talking about you know political thinking and 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 critical thought, you know, and philosophy, but in a very, you know, trendy and cool and, and young way, you know. So, um, so we very soon, we started like a global tour, we call it another world tour is possible. And we start to be in many countries helping grassroots organizations to do their own press conferences and and presenting, and also we started to work on fashion. We always work on fashion, don't ask me why, but that's something we did. Um, so we were like, you know, helping out this grassroots organization to give like a more creative, and more funny press conferences, changing the whole imaginary and the whole way of talking, you know, of the movements, which we didn't like so much how the movements were like, you know, talking about, uh, politics and so on. So we, with this project, we started to, in a very performatic way, we started to change the, the imaginary of social movements and politics. You know, here you have some examples. Sus formas de politización son diferentes a las de sus padres. So yeah. Um, I think you saw, they were like, we were creating costumes like these ones, you know, the new kids on the black look, they were like responding to, to the events, you know, like for instance, I remember when they, pro, they when they, they, um, they prohibit the use of masks, for instance, in different countries, we create this, this uh, very, this cartel neck kind of, uh, pullovers with a very tarte, we are a very long turtle neck pullovers that became like a mask when you need it, but when you don't need it, you you pretend you are like an intellectual, you know. Uh, or we did this um, this breaking away suit, I guess you saw it, you know. We did hundreds of those. And when the police tried to arrest people, uh, the, the costume, you know, broke up itself so the, the person could escape, I mean, and creating a very funny picture, you know, being naked and running, you know. So during the time that the, we were the new kids on the black block, uh, we, taste, uh, we tasted always with great humor, a series of creative strategies, you know, to combat both media criminalization and police repression, actually, that was the idea. However, as some of you can, no, already, you know, the violence and repression against the anti racism movement were on the rise, you know. The G8 counter summit in Genoa was the turning point of the anti racism movement, you know. Carlo Giuliani, a young man of 23 years old, lost his life just a few meters from where we were, you know, dressed as new kids. Uh, and from a bullet shot by a police officer, you know. So that was a traumatic incident and, and everything else that we live in those days in Genoa were an important, as I say, an important turning point in our work. So we started thinking in a new intervention model. We knew that we had to change our way of working, our way of doing art and so on. So we, we wanted to continue doing the same, fight the power of multinational companies, you know, and, and the spirit of neoliberalism, more inclusive <laughs> every time. Uh, but now we wanted to do it from everyday life, you know, uh, without depending on major events or mass demonstrations, you know. So we were convinced that, that there must be something that people did daily somehow, and that in some way it was already a threat to capitalist globalization, no matter how small it might be, you know, that threat. So we searched and searched everything until finally, one day we found something, mangar. Mangar means shoplifting, you know? It's, um, um, so this was a habit root in thousands of people, you know, 
I was causing multinational companies to lose millions. Soplifting was a kind of invisible guerrilla warfare, you know, weights daily in shopping malls around the world. So we created the Yomango brand, that's what we did, you know, precisely to make this war visible, you know, a brand that steals everything from other brands. That was the idea, you know. We set ourselves a challenge. We were, so we say like, Yomango would never create anything. All Yomango would do was steal. So for instance, uh, the slogans, you know, first in the name, right? Mango, we stole it from Mango, you know, we just add Yo, which means I, so I steal, you know? And, and the slogans of the brand, for instance, you know, we, we stole off all of them, like Yomango, because money can buy happiness. That was the MasterCard slogan in that time, for instance, you know? Or Yomango, because you can buy happiness. That was the Visa one. You know? So we felt that all the happiness represented daily in advertising hid behind it an ocean of sadness and dissatisfaction somehow. You know, in some way, Yomango was our response to that to that situation. You know? Yomango was also the way we launched to explore the confines of, of uh, true enjoyment. You know, one of the first things we did uh, when we had the logo and the website already ready um, were the Yomango dinners. You know, the Yomango dinners were something. I mean, they were. Or like a weekly gatherings, you know, where a group of people shared everything they had stolen during the week. That was, that. that's what it was. Um, and the fact that the menu, you know, couldn't be known in advance. It was like a, gave, a, it's like a stolen food Thanksgiving? Yeah, kind of, yeah, exactly. So the fact that the menu, the menu, you know, couldn't be known in advance, gave these dinners, you know, spontaneously, spontaneity and much improvisation. The, the, the Yomango dinners soon became like a real reference space in the city of Barcelona, you know, that to change many times the place because many more and more people came every time, you know. Many of the con conceived ideas, you know, that the Yomango brand would later carry out um, came from those spaces, from those dinners the first songs, you know, and many of the images that represent the brand and in its first seasons came from, from those dinners, you know. So we create a series of departments of the brand, like any other brand, you know. We have the art and design department, we have the fashion and accessories department, we have the R&D department, you know, and of course we have the marketing department, was one of the most important ones. Um, and we did not have time, you know, some of, uh, in that time, some of us sign up to work night shift, you know, in the stores of some of the largest multinational clothing companies. I remember such as Sara or H&M, you know, that's what we were doing by night, working on those companies. It was there actually in those nights <laughs> where um, that we carry out all the tests, you know, with frequency Leo. and events. We got a hard yes. stop at the top of the hour and we're almost getting there. And I, I feel oh, like yeah. this is part one of part two parts. I'm gonna might invite you back to second part, but I wanted to just give All you right. a time check. Okay, wow, that was fast, man. I mean, I didn't have control at all a lot of time. Okay, Yomango, that was long ago. We did many things. We did, you know, like a lot of tools. Uh, we were like, you know, wait, wait, Leo, Leo, but I don't think you have to rush through it because I think we maybe we could do a second one. I think we should just ask it some questions from people and let's just consider this part one. Is that okay? That sounds good to me. Does that sound good with everybody? Claire, Ginny, Trisha, Veronica, Sabian, Makala, Amber. <laughs> wait, has anybody got, I mean, listen, for the record, I just got to interject. Leo's done a lot of projects with people and they're all incredible. And I just want to, first of all, thank you for existing. Everyone give it up for Leo and all this great work. It's very punk rock and very joyous at the same time. Not an easy thing to do. Um, does anyone have some questions for Leonidas? You didn't see Matt yet. I, I do, I do. Go ahead, Amber. Um, so I was writing this down when you were talking. I, because we were in the 90s with protests and um, media and 
I was just thinking how much that's changed over, you know, the last 20, 30 years. And um, so I was wondering, um, like we haven't gotten to your more recent work at all, but going off of that work, I was kind of curious uh, to hear from you what you think has changed in either opportunities or things that aren't possible anymore now that the media has been changed so much because you really activated the press in your work and now mm -hmm. press is more decentralized and it's changed a lot and there's now like social media and that's used a lot in protests. So I was wanting to kind of ask you broadly or maybe specifically um, to respond to those thoughts of yeah. then and now. As I was as I was talking and presenting all these old projects, I was thinking all the time, wow, how the world changed, you know, how exactly it's changing the same. Many of the things we were doing that time are just like relevant or impossible to do these days, you know, because um, one of the reasons is because the whole media changed. As I mean, you are totally right. In that time, we were like pretty interested on on this. Um, on this uh, occupying the media, right? The official media and so on. After that, we were not interested on that. Also because the media changed so much, you know. Um, but that, I guess you will know it more in the second class because we will talk more about uh, the, the recent projects. But but yeah, um, you're right. At the same time, the virility, I mean, is that the word virility? I don't think that's the right, viralness. <laughs> It's definitely not virility. <laughs> That's definitely the wrong word. Uh, but like the virus nature of them seems to be very like TikTok friendly. <laughs> exactly. I know. Yeah, I've never been in TikTok. I mean, I cannot say that to my students, but I've never been there. I'm like, oh, what is that? It's like a mystery to me. The TikTok thing. Like a, I think I need to have a child to, to, to know <laughs> that. But yeah, or I mean, but you're right. I mean, media changed so much, you know. Also the idea we had about the media, you know, like in that time we were like confronting the official media with our alternative media, you know, in the media is, it was about to, to start doing things, you know. I mean, we had like these two different worlds to contrast and to clash, you know. Um, and after that, we only had one world. Right, and we were all in it, and that changes everything. Yeah. And also, the media and the information itself becomes become became like a, a task, you know, like a job, like a, <laughs> something you want to run out uh, around from it, you know. So we, our projects weren't focused on occupying any kind of media anymore, and more focused on creating communities and experiences for the real, you know, and opening the spaces of presence, you know, uh, which is a different focus, actually. Yeah. That was always in our place, also in these old ones, you know, like, I mean, the, the, the thing of gathering, meeting, you know, putting the bodies together, doing something together, you know, that was always there, but it became more and more important. I mean, we, we left the image that comes out of that more like in a second um, scenario, second stage, and we focus on on the meetings and, and the the real experiences. You know, Leo, it's you've had. Um, I got a question, which is, you've. I mean, like me and you. I mean, me and you both. I think November nineteen ninety nine, Seattle is a real turning point in our lives, obviously. But I do think yeah. um, just a question. You know, we've seen social movements come and go, and they almost come in like. Um, it feels like waves every four or five years, something, you know, and then, and then like every decade comes a big one. But like you, you start to kind of have an ebb and flow of them over the course of your life and as social movements. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, in terms of, of that, because I know in November, I remember, no, how do you, how do you manage the kind of coming and going of it and feeling like they always have different textures to them, but also a similarity. Mm -hmm. You notice how they're different yeah. and also how they're the same. How do you, I guess over the time, how do you feel that in your bones or how is that feeling for you as an artist and an activist? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I was talking about that with a friend like not so long ago and we came out with this feeling of there is the repetition of these 
uh, I mean, after some decades on this and so on, what you feel, both we were feeling like there is something that transcends, you know, that always you can find it on the other wave, you know, that, that comes up. But, but there is something that me, I mean, so I guess the social transformation is about that. It's about to lose, you know, to change your skin, but at the same time to transcend to the next step, right? But at the same time to keep something from the past, you know? And that is an equilibrium that is not, is not easy at all because many people is focused on to keep, you know, a part that doesn't, it's not relevant anymore, you know, in the future or in the current days, and they are blocked on that, you know, ideologies from the past or wherever, right? And other people is just focus on the, the change in itself, right? Like, okay, next thing, okay, another thing. And they are missing, you know, what we learned from the past. So that equilibrium between transcendence and, and integration from the past, you know, it's is the thing and it's not easy at all you know mm. and art helps a lot on that because i mean artists we are used to think about shape forms um and how the forms and changes you know so so actually we can go further with the artistic way of thinking than the political way of thinking actually in order to, to try to understand how social transformation is actually happening. You know? Anybody got a last question for Leo on his part one presentation? I have a question. What's on Veronica? So Leo, thanks, thanks so much for the talk. And I especially liked that last um, um, definition and kind of uh, critical analysis of social transformation. Uh, mm -hmm. My question actually goes back to new kids on the black box. And yeah. since I'm a black woman, I'm wondering why did you use the word black? Where is, what does black signify? Oh yeah, that was just a game with, you know, the term that the media created in that time that was black block. That's the, med that's the term the media was using all the time in order to criminalize the whole anti racism movement and other movements that came after too, like but, Occupy. But just to clarify too, it was in specific references to the anarchists that were often clad all in black and yeah. they would refer to them as the black block. So That's that was right. that was them taking a mediated term and retooling it, correct? Nice. Because they were they were dressed in black, you know. That's you know the uh, I mean it's replacing the contemporary landscape with the Antifa kind of get up. But, sure. Right. Yeah. So they call it black block. That was the term that the media was using in order to criminalize. So we were playing with that and the new kids on the block, you know, you remember yeah. that? Yeah. So we were the new kids on the black block. That was the actually a joke, you know. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's great. It's great. It's, and it's great information because I didn't know that black block was a term that existed, oh, yeah. right? So this is all over the world, actually. That, that was the idea. I mean, that was the, the tactical way of dividing and destroying the global movement. Absolutely. That term, yeah, because that makes the difference between violence and, you know, peace and, and all that. So we were like working with that myth that the media was was creating and, you know, so like doing something with it. You know? Yeah, nice, thank you. Well, listen, we have a tea time at three o'clock. I want to let everyone know that every Friday we have a visiting artist talk at two and a tea time at three. Because tea, oh, tea is a global drink, served that's at various so hours of the day. Um, I want everyone to join me in thanking again Leonidas, who we uh, we stay tuned for part two. I I, I just I'm you to go into that, but my I also have to tell you, I really believe this in my heart. I just have to say this: um, Leo has been at the center of many social movements for many years. And to do that with such joy still retained in your heart is no small skill because Lord knows one can turn down a cynical road at times working so hard and so much trouble in the world. But I think like finding joy in other people is something one of his skills are for activism and for art and clearly for all of us for life. So thank you so much for that, Leo. Thank you for having me and nice to meet you all guys. Teaching artists around the world. Artists around the world. 
emerging artists around